Hola, guapos y guapas. Today, we're going to talk about the Spanish Viceroyalty of Nueva Granada, also known as New Granada. Nueva Granada, or New Granada, was a Spanish Viceroyalty in the Americas. The Viceroyalty was what nowadays is Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela, and parts of Brazil, Peru, and Guyana. The fight for their independence was divided into two different periods, the first one not being as successful as the second one. It all began with the Anglo-Spanish War of 1796, when Spain decided to switch sides and fight alongside the French, because since they were in bad situation fighting against the French, they believed that the only way to survive the war was to fight beside them. However, that added, ended up to be a bad decision, because they entered into a bad situation with the British. The British government decided to use naval blockades in the Spanish-American ports. With that, Spain was unable to trade with their colonies and vice versa. Eventually, the Spanish king decided to allow the, co the Comercio Libre so that some trading could be accomplished. However, a lot of these trades were made in contraband, being so that the Spanish Americans would trade with the British government. Spain eventually realized that not the vice royalty angrier with the Spanish courts. Therefore, the feeling of resentfulness was already beginning to emerge amongst the population. In the year of 1808, Napoleon conquered the Kingdom of Spain and dethroned the Spanish king and placed his brother to take control of Spain and their colonies. With this going on, the colonists in New Granada began to question the structure of power between the imperial officials, known as the Peninsulares, and the local Creoles. Creoles never liked the Peninsulares that much, since they were both considered the elites. However, the Peninsulares had more important jobs, and this made the Creoles grow more and more resentful. With that in mind, the Creoles began to set up their own juntas, following the Spanish examples and assuming in Ferdinand's absence in power. This was a smart strategic move because, in a way, they would gain their independence by taking control of the entire viceroyalty without being disloyal. His brother uh, sent Spanish troops to stop these juntas from going any further. Royalists then massacred a dozen of patriots. The population and the colonies were divided into those who wanted to become independent from Spain, the Patriots, and the ones that wanted to still remain a Spanish colony, and those were the Royalists. The majority of the Creoles wanted to achieve independence and were obviously against Ferdinand, making them Patriots. However, the Lineros, who were a group of horseback rebels, were against the Creoles and fought for independence. Without the Laneros, the Creoles would never be able to achieve the independence that they wanted. Therefore, they began their plan for forming juntas under the name of Ferdinand. As Rodrigo previously said, many of these juntas were created in the Viceroyalty of New Granada. However, these juntas did not work together under the same leader. Many different juntas were formed and in 1810, the Junta in Bogota declared themselves as an independent state under the leadership of Antonio Nariño. During the year of 1810 was also when the revolution for the independence began in Cartagena, which is nowadays a city in Colombia. Years prior to the independence movements in the Spanish colonies, precisely the Viceroyalty of Nueva Granada, helped the colonists to become influenced by these movements and have the need of wanting their own independence. Americanism began to emerge in the Spanish colonies as the information of the United States independence began to spread in the colonies. Also, the French Revolution served as a great influence to the colonists. The idea of liberty sounded amazing to the colonists and many Creoles from Spain. However, on the other hand, the Spanish government, together with the officials in New Granada, tried the best they could to avoid information about these revolutions to spread in the colonies. However, that proved to be unsuc unsucce unsuccessful, and many of the colonists were still able to obtain these informations. 
For many years, New Granada had been a Spanish colony, and it had been perfectly comfortable with such rule. Everything changed, however, when the colony began to express its discontent with the Crown's long-standing conditions and policies being enforced. These were majorly due to the fact that the Crown increased taxation, as well as establishing a stricter control of the colonial government. The Comuneros' rebellion was not a movement towards the independence of New Granada. It was, indeed, a movement against the government's fiscal measures. The rebellion was led by Juan Francisco Berbeo, with the support of a large amount of Comuneros and Amerindians. As I have previously stated, it was by no means a battle, as Berbeo negotiated with the Archbishop, resulting in the cap capitulation of Zipaquira, which reduced taxes, gave more po political credibility to the Creoles, and improved the conditions of the Amerindians. Even though the capitulations were Im implemented, a considerable, a considerable amount of mestizos and Amerindians continued to riot. However, Berbeo and other leaders of the Comuneros were now siding with the authorities and punishing the rebels. The rebellions began indeed in 1810, led by the Creoles in Cartagena. It was soon spread to the other cities, and eventually the Viceroy of Bogota was opposed. Revolutionary movements soon staggered into conflict, as some other territories wanted to keep their connection to the Spanish crown. As we have mentioned before, various juntas were created, and eventually the creation of the United Provinces of New Granada in 1811. However, the Junta of Bogota rejected the federal constitution and under the command of Antonio Nariño set itself into one independent state. Due to the conflict within the Creole factions, the royalists had time to gradually re-establish their power and eventually gain control of the colony. Nariño, having printed the Declaration of Rights of Men in French, was then exiled to Spain in the year of 1814. The Constitution focused primarily on the equality of its citizens, regardless of their race. It also promoted federal structure and took away the privileges for those in the military and the church. However, the Constitution really didn't do much for the non-whites and was largely opposed by the Criollo and Secure as it would have been if they were still under the Spanish rule. Many Creoles sided with the Royalists when they rega regained their forces. After negotiating his surrender, Francisco de Miranda was captured and handed over by Bolivar himself, who now viewed him as a traitor in regards of the independence movement. Bolivar then escaped to New Granada and in 1813 invaded Venezuela, declaring war to death against the Spanish authorities. He has been assisted with the previously established United Provinces of New Granada. After indeed being successful in liberating Venezuela, Bolivar declared the Second Republic in 1813 and was titled the Liberator of Venezuela. To Bolivar, however, democratic assemblies were not, take, were not really taken into consideration as many of the non-whites had wished. He was in fact a military dictator. Bolivar was eventually defeated in June 1814 in the famous Battle of La Puerta. As a result of his defeat, he first fled to New Granada and later on to Jamaica. Finally, in January 1815, Venezuela had been won back and was once again under the rule of the royalists, in other words, the Spanish crown. The same year following Napoleon's defeat, Ferdinand VII reclaimed his position and restored the Spanish throne. However, many Creoles still favored an independent republic and self-rule. Since Ferdinand hadn't been king for some time, monarchy was re not really present in the colonies, co colonies. In conclusion, it was unclear whether or not loyalty really mattered. As a result, the, the great majority of the patriots had achieved a certain level of autonomy within the monarchy. For the, fact that the for the fact that Venezuela 
had been previously liberated, the Crown made sure to leave no possible space for movement against colonial administration and any type of opposition was considered a tre as treason. The reconciliation process was very difficult, especially for the action of savage royalists who participated in mass executions and confiscation of property of the patrons. Such actions are known to be counterproductive but they still existed within the colony. The dream of a better future for the colony had already been spread and races such as castas, blacks and Amerindians were aware of, of leaders such as Bolivar who were committed to enforce equality and freedom. Bolivar was certainly not a man that was easily defeated, and in December 1816, he initiated yet another campaign to liberate Venezuela, this time with the assist of the Haitians. He was also able to gain support of local warlords, who had their own private armies, as well as more than 6,000 British and Irish soldiers who were unemployed after the Napoleonic Wars were finalized. Such soldiers had a lot of war experience and professionalism, which was certainly transpassed to the rest of Bolivar's army. Bolivar then allied with one of the most relevant and powerful local warlords, called José Antonio Pais. Pais' soldiers had been waging guerrilla war against royalist forces for a considerable amount of time. Bolivar was chirurgic with his ability to unify, unify his army which consisted of several different forces. He promised equality for the pardos and freedom for the slaves, and this served as an in 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 incentives for such races to support him and fight on his side. Marching north towards Venezuela would certainly be a huge challenge for Bolivar, since he knew that most of the royalists who held the greatest political and economic influence over Venezuela wouldn't be easily defeated. He then came up with a plan to cross the Andes in order to conquer Venezuela by first attaining New Granada, where the forces were spread and not really that powerful. His plan was to join Francisco de Paula Santander, who was leading a significant amount of patriots and later on focus on attacking Bogotá. As Bolivar continued with his plan to cross the Andes Mountains, he arrived in New Granada by 1890. Even though he had lost a considerable amount of soldiers, he still surprised the loyalists with his unorthodox move. He then continued his quest towards Bogota. With only 2,000 men, Bolivar was able to defeat a royalist army that had a thousand more soldiers than his, did at Boyacá Department. With the help of General Santander, who held more down the troops of the Royalist vanguard, Bolivar was able to attack the rest of the Royalist forces. Without his best troops, General Barreiro quickly realized his defeat and quickly surrendered while the Patriots lost only 13 soldiers and had an astonishing number of only 53 wounded soldiers. Bolivar was then able to seize Bogotá on August 10th. The Spanish Viceroy fled quickly after the defeat. General Morillo surprised surprised how quick Bolivar was able to succeed, made sure to message the crown with the need of more troops. He went on to capture Bogota on 10th of August, seizing much of the royalist treasures, treasury as the Spanish viceroy fled. While the Patriots had gained a significant amount of territory within Latin America, area, Latin America areas such as Quito, Panama, Caracas, and the most populated areas of Venezuela, were still under control of the royalist forces. Right before the final confrontation between the Patriots and Royalists, there was a significant and unexpected change in, in the political landscape, which granted a decisive advantage towards the patri patriotic forces. On June 24, 1821, Bolivar fought the Battle of Caribou against Morillo's success. Sir. With the fall of the Caracas, only two days after the battle, basically Venezuela was fully liberated. After this battle, in April 1821, the majority of the fighting between the Royalists and the Patriots came to an end. 
Spanish general Miguel de la Torre decided to take the offensive against Bolivar and Paix once Caracas was threatened by the Patriot forces. Bolivar decided to divide his army, sending part of his troops to push an offensive towards the Royalist flanks, while sending the rest to hold back the Patriots' attack at de la Torre's position. Bolivar was eventually able to beat the Royalists with the assist of his British Legion and superior cavalry. Even though Venezuela and New Granada were now controlled by the Patriots, the Royalists still remained in the territory in a few posts. The Republic of Gran Colombia was later on acclaimed by the Congress of Cúcuta. It consisted, it consisted of the territories of Venezuela, New Granada and Ecuador. Simón Bolívar was commanded the president of such republic. As Bolívar wanted to continue his fight for independence, he joined forces with Santander on July 1819. He would then take part of the Battle of Boyacá, as mentioned before, the most decisive battle for independence. Three days later, he conquered Bogotá. New Granada had now fallen into Patriot, Patriot's hand. In December of the same year, all provinces in New Granada became independent and the Republic of Gran Colombia was created by Simón Bolívar, which soon after became the president, uh, as the forcing making a very authoritarian rule. Hello, I'm Simón Bolívar, the liberator they call me. I am the person that freed the Viceroyalty of New Granada from Spanish government. I'm also the founder of the Gran Colombia and its president. You monster! I am a royalist and I don't agree with you. You should die. Don't mess with me, Colombia. <laughs> right after being named the president of Gran Colombia, Bolivar made sure to leave Vice President Santander in charge of domestic matters while he would continue fighting the Royalist forces in order to liberate more territories within Latin America. His priority was Panama, which proclaimed independence in 1821 and joined Gran Colombia. Being a very ambitious man, Bolivar continued with his quest and marched into Ecuador in 1822, battling royal, royal, royalist forces in Pasto and Popayan, both territories located in the southern part of Colombia. Bolivar's lieutenant, Antonio José de Sucre, who had been fighting in Quito, was then able to free Ecuador when he defeated the royalist forces in the mountains of the Pichincha volcano, which is nowadays extinct. Finally, that was the route that Simon Bolivar needed to cross in order to free the vice royalty of New Granada and Venezuela. And well, this is our presentation. Hope you enjoyed it and see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> The King of Spain eventually realized that the Comunero Libre was getting a bit out of Comunero Libre. Tá, já é. Então só começa desde a minha parte. This was a smart strategy. He tried to liberate Venezuela. However, he was unsuccessful. Merda. Me ajuda, porra. Essa não me ajuda, cara. Foi um peito muito soft. Deixa eu fazer uma pergunta. Também.